Um, this is the region we looked at. We actually considered the, the Northeast as well as the uh, three uh, maritime provinces in Canada over the last uh, 103 years and over the last 33 years. You'll see that the, the main uh, thing you see here is that there's lots of interannual climate variability in New England, right? If you don't like the weather, wait a minute. Despite that interannual variability, we can see that there's some long-term trends. And all of these trends that I have plotted up here are statistically significant. So we we've seen a 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit warming over the course of the last 103 years, but a 1.8 degree warming just over the last 33 years. So the rate of the increase of warming uh, has, has increased over the last 33 years. When we look at the spatial nature of that warming, uh, the dots here represent uh, the interpolate, the, um, that linear trend over the last 33 years. You can see that the entire region has warmed. This isn't sort of one or two urban stations that are driving the data set. This is the entire region uh, has warmed. Uh, we also looked at seasonal temperature variation. This is probably one of the most shocking results that came out is that while winters have warmed over the last 103 uh, years by a little over 2 degrees Fahrenheit, they've warmed by 4.3 degrees Fahrenheit over the last 33 years. Lest you don't think this is a big deal, that's the equivalent of taking a Boston wintertime climate that existed 35 years ago and moving it somewhere south of Philadelphia. This is not climate change in the future. This is climate change that we are experiencing now. And if you've been here for the last 20 or 30 years, you've seen this and you know that this has happened. Um, uh, we also getting into perhaps things that, that you might be a little bit more interested in, uh, and I think society sort of tends to focus on temperature, but that's not really going to be the, in, the big impact. Uh, water certainly is a, a major, a major issue here. We looked at precipitation. We saw there's a, a long-term increasing trend. Uh, perhaps more importantly than just sort of average annual precipitation is we looked at the frequency of extreme precipitation events and there's lots of different ways you can define these. We chose to define it as greater than two inches of rain in a 48 hour period. Uh, and uh, we looked at all these stations and we, we looked at the trends. Uh, this is now over the last uh, 53, 54 years from 1949. And what we found was that in uh, most of the stations we've seen an increase in the frequency of extreme precipitation events. And this only goes up to 2002, so it doesn't include 2005 and 2006, which are now, for me, the poster child of extreme precipitation events. What we're seeing, I've plotted here, is an increase in the percentage. So we're seeing, in some areas, uh, an increase of 100%. So instead of two or three, we're seeing four or six uh, extreme precipitation events. And now, on top of that, our extreme precipitation events are now seven inches, or 10 inches, or 15 inches. So we're getting much uh, larger events, which don't show up in this data. But this is a real cause for concern. Uh, that we're seeing uh, a slight increase in the amount of precipitation, but it's coming in much fewer events. But almost every station we look at shows that there has been a decrease in the number of days with snow on the ground, to the point where Durham, uh, 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 where we are down at the University of New Hampshire, actually has 30 fewer days per winter with snow on the ground today compared to 33 years ago. All right, a full month less of snow on the ground. But I think that there's a very close correlation between this rapid warming that we've seen in winter and this decrease in snow on the ground. As you warm up winter a little bit, you're going to decrease the snow cover. When you decrease that snow cover, more solar radiation is going to hit the surface, a darker surface is going to absorb more of that radiation. It's going to melt more of the snow. So once you warm a little bit, what the snow cover does is provides this positive feedback loop which amplifies uh, the initial signal. I think uh, some of Glenn Hodgkin's data uh, out of the, and his colleagues out of the USGS, and they looked at the um, center of volume dates on a number of uh, undammed, unregulated rivers uh, across uh, New England. And what you see here is uh, where that center of volume flow is. Uh, these are all, all the rivers. You can see all the ones in northern New England starting, once again, right around 1970, begin to show an earlier and earlier center of volume flow. Right, so that's the 50% that's the, the of the flow that comes down between the 1st of January and the 31st of May. You see down here on the Connecticut rivers, there's not much of a signal, not a lot of snow in Connecticut anymore. Right? So we're seeing a, a significant change in the hydrology of uh, many of the rivers across the region. We look at the records going back here to the 1920s, and what we see is that on average, the ice is leaving 4.5 days earlier, but over the last 36 years, the ice is actually leaving more than a week earlier in average across all these lakes. And what you see is that the ice in date is getting uh, later and later. Uh, it's about, what, 14 days later over the course of the last 190 years. But even more important here, these red diamonds at the bottom of the figure 
actually highlight years when the ice did not come in at all. What you're beginning to see is a threshold response for ice cover in Lake Champlain. And our winters have warmed up to the point now where ice just isn't coming in. And then there's sea level rise. Uh, these are tidal records from New York and Boston. Uh, the New York record going back to 1850. Uh, you can see that sea level has gone up by about 18 or 19 inches. We're particularly vulnerable on the coast here because our coast is sinking as sea level is rising. And that's going to be a big issue that we're going to have to deal with. These are scenarios that actually relate to the amount of greenhouse gas that we're going to emit into the atmosphere. You can see there's a whole bunch of different scenarios. The two that we focus on is A1FI, which is a fossil fuel intensive scenario. It's the red dotted line. You can see here we are emitting about uh, seven um, gigatons of carbon per year, and that just sort of takes off the end of the uh, end of the graph here on the x-axis is 2,100 years. So we just increase our emissions up to about 27 to 28 gigatons of carbon per year. This is a uh, world where we continue to get most of our energy from fossil fuel, but it's also a world where we play nice in the global sandbox and everybody gets along to solve problems. We just keep getting our energy from fossil fuel. The other scenario I want you to look at is the one in green on the bottom, that's B1. Uh, uh, that's a scenario where we also play nice in the global sandbox, but we actually embrace renewable technologies and we embrace energy efficiency and we do everything that we can to get our energy from non-fossil fuel sources. All right? So what's going to happen to climate change in the Northeast uh, looking at these two different scenarios? Uh, what we have here in black uh, is uh, the observed record that I've already shown you, although this time now it's just for the Northeast United States. If we follow the high emissions scenario in red, what you see is that by the end of the century, 2100, we would expect average annual temperatures to be 6.5 to 12.5 degrees Fahrenheit warmer. Conversely, if we follow the B1 or the low emissions scenario, we would expect temperatures on average to be 3.5 to 6.5 degrees Fahrenheit warmer. Note that there's a significant difference depending on the choices we make about where our energy comes from. Um, uh, so uh, one of the things we tried to do was say, well, what does that mean for, uh, for Maine? And we put together a whole series of these migrating state uh, diagrams. And this is the one uh, for Maine. What you see is that uh, there's a lot of information here under the high emission scenario. What we find is that southern Maine will essentially have a climate that is comparable to West Virginia today. Conversely, if we actually follow the low emission scenario, we see that uh, southern Maine will have a climate comparable to southern Connecticut or New York City. So currently, uh, we have sort of zero or one day above 100 degrees Fahrenheit on average in Boston. Under the high emission scenario, we would expect 24 days per year hotter than 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the black line, once again, uh, are, is the observational record. We see a real big difference between the two scenarios in terms of precipitation. Right? It goes up slightly. Um, and so you see that we have warmer temperatures and we have a slight increase in the amount uh, of precipitation. Right? Across all three scenarios, we have uh, sort of a similar amount uh, of increase in precipitation. Next one. You see for, uh, for the winter time period, there's not a lot of change. But here's the real kicker. It's the summer that's the trouble. We don't see much of a change in precipitation in summertime, but we see a dramatic increase in temperature in summertime. What does that mean? Evaporation. Drought. Drought. Yeah. Right? So we use this uh, Princeton variable infiltration capacity model to actually do a, a whole water balance approach. So we're not just looking at precipitation, but we're looking at sort of the entire system. And, and this was, if winter temperature was the real sort of standard result of how climate has changed in the past, the frequency of drought in the future is sort of one of the major take home messages here. You can see that short term drought on average, we experience one about every 10 years, maybe every 15 years. But about every two to three years, we have a short-term drought across almost the entire region. Under the high emission scenario, we would expect almost all, of New almost all of New England is in red in that figure, and that represents 30 droughts in 30 years. So the change here that we're looking under a high emission scenario is that we would expect a drought almost every year. And that's not because precipitation is changing a lot, it's because precipitation only increases slightly, but temperatures go up a lot, so there's a lot more evaporation. And you can see that the big loser here is uh, upstate New York. 
they get they, they, for some reason under this analysis is experiencing much more uh, long-term drought are uh, sort of going from May uh, to October and you can see that we have sort of about a one month period where we have relatively low flow below this level set up by the US Fish and Wildlife Service as being an issue for ecosystems. All right, and sea level is going to rise. Uh, for there to be a series of reports that comes out on the effect of climate change on forests, on coastal infrastructure, on marine resources, on agriculture, on human health, and on winter recreation. Time for uh, one or two questions. <laughs>